Um, I think we're I think we're ready to get going. Although I think we we may still be a few minutes early, but it, it also appears to be standing room only. So, like there's there's a chair over here if you want. Come on. Okay. So to make sure you're all in the right place, uh, this is enterprise vendors in the OpenStack ecosystem. But, okay. Cool. Um, really, we I've got some seed questions, but we want to make this as interactive as possible. There's microphones throughout the room, or if you shout really loudly, I can repeat your question. Um, on stage with us, we have in no particular order, particularly because they're not actually sitting in the order that I've uh, put them up there. Um, you just want to kind of go uh, from closest or from the microphone at the far end all the way this way. Uh, introduce yourself, who you're with, and then we'll uh, we'll get going. I'm Mark McLaughlin from EMC. I'm uh, the other Mark McLaughlin. I believe there's a uh Red Hat, uh, number one contributor to the uh, foundation. That's not me, uh, and, uh, but I'm the MC guy. My name is Jim Walker. I'm director of product marketing at Hortonworks. If you're not familiar with Hortonworks, we are one of a few uh, Apache Hadoop distributions that will now run on top of OpenStack. Robert Esker with NetApp. Been uh, leading our efforts, development efforts the last couple of years. By the way, thanks for the clarification. Uh, it explains a lot when I was asking the uh, Oslo questions to you earlier. <laughs> I guess you're not the Oslo PTL. Apologies. Hi, I'm Andre Pesh with Arista Networks, and uh, I run our OpenStack uh, development efforts there. And I'm Pete Yamasaki with AMD. I'm Director of Product Management, and we're part of the uh, Server Solutions BU, which is C-Micro, which was acquired by AMD one year ago. So, good afternoon. My name is Didier Storp. I'm with Brocade in a product management role. Uh, I've been looking at uh, OpenStack since uh, pretty much its inception, uh, a couple of years ago. And uh, we are basically uh, building uh, solutions that are best optimized for OpenStack at Brocade, right? And we'll talk more about that in just a minute. Okay, so we've got a pretty good selection of folks that are in the ecosystem or involved in the ecosystem. Um, do you want me to start with seed questions or do you guys have anything? Come on. You're all here for something. All right, so uh, let's start with, uh, where do you guys see the ecosystem in say the next five years or so? So like what, or let, let me rephrase. Uh, how do you see the current state of the OpenStack ecosystem and where do you see that evolving to in five years? Okay, so I guess I'm going to get started, all right? Um, this time we'll work closest from me yeah. back the other way. All right, so, uh, so basically uh, I think that, uh, well, it's, it's really amazing to see where we are at today, right? You know, take a look at this OpenStack initiative. Uh, it started, you know, back in 2010 sometime, and uh, just a couple of years later we are here with uh, OpenStack, at this OpenStack Summit, gathering 3,000 people and also uh, with a huge, rich, and very broad ecosystem that is already in place, right? Uh, there's lots of companies out there that are building business model around OpenStack. Some of them looking at uh, OpenStack from purely a software perspective. Some companies are building hardware-based solution, but also you see uh, companies basically taking a stand in terms of support services, engineering services, and Obviously, also some system integrator basically embracing OpenStack and offering their services. So I would say I'm amazed. Uh, just a couple of years later, we are here with you know this rich, broad ecosystem. Uh, I, however, I would say that most likely, you know, we are just at the beginning of the journey. There is a lot that remains to be done, and uh, in my view, there is lots that we need to focus on as a team in terms of bringing OpenStack in the enterprise, making OpenStack much more consumable by the enterprise segment, right? And what I'm getting at is, is this uh, OpenStack is still very much this uh, um, infrastructure as a service orchestration engine, right? Basically a set of APIs that are low level that talks to the underlying infrastructure. 
OpenStack, in my view, needs to move up the stack of you know, the cloud orchestration framework and getting to a place where we can have also performance monitoring as well as resource quota monitoring for uh, VM instances. What? Wouldn't it be great to have a system that would tell you that, let's say, in a few days, all your VMs are going to be exhausting the capacity in the infrastructure? Billing, accounting, ser service catalog, and self-service portals. All those components basically need to be created to really bring OpenStack in the enterprise and to make it much more consumable. And that's where I see uh, this uh, ecosystem helping about out. the next five years or so? Yeah. Okay. Pretty much. Pete? Um, thanks. Um, well, I haven't been involved as long as you have. Uh, this is my third OpenStack Summit event. But uh, I've seen a significant change. So where would I say the state of the industry is today? Well, the, the one I went to two day, two, two years, a uh, year and a half ago in San Francisco, what I really felt was most of the people attending were developers. There were a few, few people actually looking at real deployments. But what I saw really change was the summit after that down in San Diego, where I started to see a lot of people who were really interested in actually trying to build infrastructure as a service based on OpenStack. And now we come to Portland and there's even more people. So where do I see this being in five years? Or where do I w hope to see it? Well, simply, I'd like to see OpenStack as the de facto cloud op open cloud operating system. And for that being the case, there's you know, some predictions I'd like to make here. So you know, in five years, where do we want to be? Number one, I see it a lot like Linux, um, where Linux is today, where Linux is the open operating system. There's a number of supported distributions out there. Uh, it's easy to install, free to use initially, but there's also companies out there who provide enterprise level support and distributions for those who really want to run a supported uh, you know, application based on OpenStack. Um, next thing I want to see is seamless federation. And I think this is what OpenStack allows, is the ability to um, seamlessly federate between your private and public clouds. So this is one of the reasons we've been working with Rackspace is I think they start bringing that a little closer to the truth is now they're actually certifying the hardware. They're building a distribution that they use in-house and providing as private clouds. So that's going to help with that federation. Uh, thirdly, um, I'd like to, I think we're going to see a lot of innovation from both software as well as hardware providers. This has been a little bit harder to do with some of the closed cloud solutions because it's harder for the, the hardware innovators to bring new in innovations. They can't develop. They can't you know, submit their own changes to OpenStack. And uh, lastly, I, I think we're going to see a real thriving community um, of, of these hardware vendors and software vendors. And as he said before, we'd like to see it move up the stack, go beyond infrastructure as a service, where people are now deploying not just a piece of software that runs on a server. It's an entire application that you can deploy as software as a service or plat platform on a service on top of OpenStack. I'll go, I'll go quick here. I guess kind of... Uh, echoing your sentiment there, I think what's been really exciting looking just at, at what our customers have been asking of us over the past couple of years and looking forward is that it's, it's, it's clear that OpenStack has really arrived in, um, in our customer demands where they're, they're not just looking at it and ex experimenting with it, but also looking to really deploy it. And this, you know, this has evolved in terms of the type of customer that's willing to make the, the investment in deploying it from very large cloud providers to now um, even smaller enterprises. And I think part of that is um, reflective of the, the cooperation and partnerships among people to put together OpenStack solutions like Rackspace's certification and others. Um, and I think looking forward, I, I won't make too many predictions, but I think that's, that's certainly something I see continuing to make it easy to deploy and manage and, and automatically provision and grow your, your OpenStack clouds. So the... Uh I believe once upon a time, a guy named Bill Gates said that nobody would need more than 640K of memory ever. So I'm going to go ahead and avoid the five-year prediction. Um, but, but as a general rule, um, the evolution of, of OpenStack seems to require, in order to be accepted and consumable, repeatable, you know, become more of a known quantity and allow mere mortals to actually deploy it, it's needed you know, at this evolutionary stage, it's needed something like a Rackspace cloud private software. And frankly, there are other distributions as well, I think will play a, a relevant role here. 
So in moving to a, a point where there, there are these known quantity distributions, we're, I think, entering a new phase where we're going to see much broader adoption of OpenStack. I think it's also important to kind of think of OpenStack not just as, it, as the whole entity, but maybe also the, the abstractions, the APIs that it presents. So if, for example, Sunder becomes kind of the, the industry standard mechanism, the provisioning control plane for accessing block storage, it may not necessarily be OpenStack itself. It's something that, that evolved from OpenStack. Uh, and as such, you know, any development you're, you're, you're putting in upstream is, is going to be more broadly broadly applicable than OpenStack itself. So I think that's an important consideration. Um, I, I think just an observation around, I guess, rationalization of, of movement to cloud. There'd been a big rush and you know, cloud washing became a term. Let's hit that checkbox. I have something. It was sort of shared. It was sort of multi-tenant. That's my cloud. Um, but you know, Or maybe, hey, Amazon, I heard the thing. I read the thing in CIO magazine and I got I to gotta have my AWS, whatever that means. Well. There's a next step, which is, um, hey, what does this actually afford me? And, and I think most folks kind of see hyperscale cloud providers for the value of, of you know, instantaneous availability. I got a credit card, start my development project now, built it against Elastic Infrastructure. I don't really know what my workload will amount to, so this is a perfect place to put it. But the rationalization exercise is, over time, as you understand that workload, the economics may favor moving it back on-prem. And so what is the mechanism for doing that? And OpenStack seems to be the obvious reason, obvious way to do that. Uh, imagine kind of a, a broad uh, uh, deployment of OpenStack-based clouds around the world in the true promise of, of hybrid, the ability to burst back and forth between them. I think OpenStack avails that. Um, I, five years is an entirely way too long time to predict, um, especially in this space. Uh, OpenStack, you know, I, I represent a company that's in the Apache Hadoop world. Um, where Hadoop was a year ago to where it is today is a completely different world. Um, and I think what's the same thing is happening in the OpenStack space. I think if you look at where we were a year ago to where we are today, it's completely changed. And so for us, we feel that you know, Hadoop is kind of a killer app for OpenStack. I think they're kind of marching hand in hand together over a cliff and really kind of is the future of a lot of what's going on a lot of the enterprises. Um, Hadoop is representing net new workloads in organizations. And where is the best place to put these net new workloads? If you have scale out, compute, network, and storage, it's obviously virtualized and in the cloud. And if you look at one OpenStack piece with another OpenStack piece, it all makes sense and goes together. I think the biggest challenges to both Hadoop and to OpenStack are what I call the 10 or 12 questions that are in every RFP that I've ever answered in my entire life. Redundancy, reliability, security, all that core stuff that we all have to have. And I think those are the things that we're going to have to get past in order for everything to be adopted. I think um, <clears throat> I, I see kind of um, uh, OpenStack kind of where EMC is, so to speak, in terms of we're just getting started. In terms of uh, EMC's perspective with, uh, with OpenStack is we've contributed to Grizzly some, some kind of baseline functionality. But over the next six months as we move towards Havana, you're going to see a lot more EMC activity, just like I think you're going to see a lot more, of course, OpenStack activity. And I, and I agree 100% with the comments from, from NetApp in terms of um, uh, the accelerant to the OpenStack fire will be through the distros, through programs like Rackspace and others. So as large do-it-yourself customers are relatively you know, self-sustaining in terms of skills to be able to deploy something like this, but as the distros start to do the certification and the support, I think it's going to accelerate significantly into the, uh, into the enterprise space. Um, more so into Havana, and that also coincides with, uh, with how EMC is going to considerably ramp up our, our particip participation as well. Okay. So uh, there's a microphone right there, if you don't mind. Hi, guys. Um, just a question for each one of you. Uh, can you give an example of one feature that your company has uh, you know, given or like, you know, contributed to OpenStack? And one feature or something, some kind of product that you guys built of OpenStack that is, you know, you is pay for, like uh, your customers will benefit from having your company. It has to have a difference between what do you guys do for the community and what do you guys do as a, a value added? Start the forest and come back. So I'm on the spot. Thanks a lot. Um. <laughs> Tag, you're it. It's easier to go first. <laughs> you have to think. You know, so, so just like I said, uh, you know, EMC is starting off. Uh, just like OpenStack, and, and I would say, you know, we're 10 or 20% into it. 
So to be perfectly honest, you know, we're starting right now with basically what we call platforms and protocols. So from a roadmap perspective, the way we manage our roadmap is we're going to fill out our platforms and we're going to fill it out across the protocols. Okay? So one of the things that we've contributed to the community, to answer your first question, was a presentation that was given earlier this morning by someone from our team, uh, Edgar St. Pierre, who is involved with Fiber Channel. Right? So we're working with Brocade and, um, uh, let's see, IBM and HP, of course, uh, on contributing fi Fiber Channel. Uh, so that's contributing into the, um, into the community. In terms of value-added capabilities from EMC, you don't see that quite yet. You're going to see that in Havana. And in Havana, you're going to start to see uh, greater exploitation of kind of data services from EMC around HA and DR. Okay, so I'm going to leave it kind of at that point. But there's a number of announcements. There. Some of them are coming out at uh, EMC World, which I hope to see most of you at next month. But there'll be uh, some very important announcements at EMC World that will have an OpenStack uh, vein running through it. Um, for us, from, you know, there's two sides of that question. What have we contributed? There's a lot of work we're doing in terms of creating an HDFS. So HDFS is a highly distributed file system for Hadoop, um, distributed storage, and HDFS to Swift connector. A lot of work going on in that area right now. Um, the other area is really around deployment options and how do you deploy Hadoop and simplify deployment of Hadoop on OpenStack. So we're doing a lot of work within the community uh, on that side. What do we sell? Uh, we don't sell software. We sell support and services. So every single thing we write goes back into an open source project, be it in the Apache Software Foundation or within OpenStack. Every line of code we write goes back into, uh, into the community. That's part of our DNA. So um, NAP's involvement in terms of contribution uh, submissions started in the Essex release. And uh, we deb debuted what at the time were referred to as Nova Volume Drivers that since evolved into a separate service referred to as Cinder. Um, that's grown over time. So we, we initially enabled one mode of operation and, and now we have several different deployment choices. Uh, and in particular, we have a kind of a next generation sort of uh, uh, mode of operation for our storage controllers called Clustered on Tap that uh, we're exploiting. And, you know, the basic theme is to avail core NetApp capabilities within the context of OpenStack, make them accessible through the abstraction that Cinder presents. Uh, so in, it, that's not necessarily something that we're, we're, um, s we're not selling that, we're enabling the usage of NetApp with OpenStack to empower OpenStack to access the capabilities that are otherwise valuable to folks when they, when they elect to, to deploy NetApp. Um, in terms of uh, other contributions, we uh, actually just this week are announcing that we've submitted a prototype to add a, an entirely new service to OpenStack. Uh, and, and there's still some community discussion around the form that that ought to take, but the code is available as a work in prog process, or progress submission in, in Garrett. Uh, basically, it implements file shares as a service, so provides access to shared file systems amongst tenants uh, in much the same way that Cinder is a, a con provisioning control plane for block storage. This allows you to, to request and receive coordinated access to shared file systems across tenants, and, or you know, in the, in the more modular sense, you need not necessarily be tenants, but other consumers maybe more for, for um, non-virtualized systems. Programmatically get at access existing share file share, uh, shared file systems or create net new ones. And it's built to be sufficiently abstract to apply to NFS, SIFs, varieties thereof, perhaps an HDFS, more of a distributed file system capability, Lustre, the list goes on. Uh, and that's a, a net new strategic addition to, to OpenStack and, and, and not a basic enablement, if you will. Uh, we, have, we have also a, a tremendous amount of interest in um, uh, what Swift represents. Uh, it's come out of a philosophical question. You know, is Swift only a service or is Swift an API? Uh, it, it's our per position that, that Swift presents a, a de facto standard API and you could, uh, you could take a look at uh, our, uh, our portfolio and, and see that there are object storage capabilities and, and perhaps uh, in the future those dots will connect. So um, that's a bit about where we're at. So uh, like EMC, I think at Arista our con contributions are really just starting now and ramping up. Our main focus has been on how to integrate physical network orchestration and monitoring into quantum. So quantum, as you know, is really good at orchestrating the virtual network, but we really want to go a step further and be able to take the information that's provisioned in the virtual network, apply it to the physical network, and really truly get end-to-end -end provisioning of both your virtual and physical network in your cloud deployment. 
Um, so that's where our, our contributions are, are really focused on right now. And to plug our design summit, to, uh, it's tomorrow uh, afternoon on, on that topic. In terms of where our value is, um, you know, I, I think that we're trying to, we kind of have two value propositions. One is really just being the best physical network infrastructure f to run your cloud on. But really where, where we um, provide our value within OpenStack is working with partners who deploy their, who provide OpenStack solutions and providing a platform and unique capabilities with which they can um, provide a better OpenStack solution. So as, as an example, we have multiple um, OpenStack providers who are actually running their software directly on top of EOS, our operating system on the top of rack switch. And they're doing this to enable um, better auto provisioning and uh, auto configuration as part of that OpenStack cloud. And so I think that's really where, where the kind of value that, that you know, customers pay for is, if that makes sense. Thanks. So, so I think we're going to be in a little bit, my company, uh, AMD C Micro, we're in a slightly different position than the other vendors because um, what we've really done, and let me start with, I think the value that we bring to OpenStack is to a degree we've reinvented the server. And there's two things we reinvented with that server. First is we you know, changed the game in terms of providing better space and power. And the second thing is we've converged a lot of the infrastructure elements into a single fabric platform. We converge servers, networking, and storage. So for us, it's this capability and how do we provide, how do we take this value and you know, bring it back into the community? So the first thing we're focusing on, and it, it's sort of two-phase, uh, you know, we don't have, you know, we're still a small company, we're a startup that was recently acquired, and we're in the process of growing. So we're taking baby steps right now. And the first thing we want to do is how do we take this converged architecture? And how do we make it consumable? How do we make it useful for OpenStack? So the first thing we're concentrating on is, now that you have all these elements, you can almost have a cloud in the box. Or you, or you can tie it to external systems. So we have shared storage within our system. So how can we make the shared storage available? Some people want targets through EMC or NetApp, through Cinder outside, but in some cases, they're gonna to wanna to deploy the whole thing in the box. So what we've been working on is, how do we include things like the Cinder API into our management layer? And what we're not trying to do is we're not trying to change it, we wanna provide a standards-based API for configuring our storage so people can use something they're familiar with, something their tools are familiar with, rather than integrating to one of our unique um, you know, management layers. So we think that's very powerful. So what we're doing right now is trying to make it easy to deploy all of OpenStack on our system. The second step is now how do we take this infrastructure and make it useful? In our system, our today's system, we have a 10RU system that has 256 Atom servers or 64 Xeon servers in 10RU. In 10 so, you know, if we follow the OpenStack model, you can deploy virtual machines using Nova Compute. Now what if we took Nova Compute, put that on our management layer, and now we could take selective hardware no nodes and use the same mechanisms that you use to deploy VMs and also deploy physical machines. And we haven't contributed anything yet into the community. We've been working on this and we want to work with the com community to deploy something that's going to be industry standard. But for us, we see it as because of the architecture we're, we're bringing, there's some unique value add that we want to bring in phase two. Yep. All right. <clears throat> so um, uh, I'd like to start by mentioning that Brocade, Brocade Communication System, joined the Alliance back in May 2011. So that's more than two years ago, right? Uh, so, uh, as from there on, we have already, as a team, as a company, we already started to clearly identify what it means for us, for a networking company, to be part of this alliance. And uh, obviously, uh, what we've been doing, like uh, some of our um, partners here from the networking side, we've been starting to basically consume OpenStack, right? It's the easy piece to get done. There is quantum API that uh, a company can take and basically leverage to create uh, interoperability with uh, your networking platform and, and solution. So we uh, just uh, contributed back our Brocade Virtual Cluster Switch plugin, which enables Ethernet fabric services to be completely orchestrated by 
OpenStack. So, and again, you know, it's uh, it's a contribution that uh, is very much focused on consuming OpenStack and the work that this community as such has been doing. We've, we've got some extension that we've done in that con context, a little bit around the line of what Arista, Arista mentioned with a different approach, right? On the IP side, we are also consuming OpenStack to create interop with uh, the load balancer as a service API that just got folded under Quantum. So we've got our own product client for load balancing. And we are actually the first in this community to basically have a prototype running for orchestrating layer four to layer seven services, again, for OpenStack Quantum. Now, the piece that is more interesting is really the work that you are doing with uh, EMC. Uh, I think it's, you know, um, Brocade has been championing this effort, and we started to work on that six months ago already. What we've done is basically taking a hard look at how we can enable the Cinder component to be extended in such a way that not only you can actually manage iSCSI, but you can also manage fiber channel storage and fiber channel SAN. So six months ago, we had this idea. Uh, we reached out to a tier one uh, storage vendor, uh, EMC, IBM, uh, and a few others, uh, including HP. And uh, what we started to do is weekly call to basically come up with the design of what it means to have fiber channel support in OpenStack. So uh, I, I would say that uh, the results are really speaking for themselves. In the Grizzly release, the fiber channel storage work has been done. So those extensions are there uh, with uh, multiple plugins provided by vendors, right? And in the Havana release, Brocade is gonna, de is gonna be taking the lead in terms of implementing those abstraction and representation of fiber channel sand services into OpenStack. It basically boils down to a fabric, uh, an FC sand zone manager, right? Plus, obviously, we're gonna add our own plugin as well uh, as part of the Havana release. So I think we are, we are definitely embracing OpenStack I I at Brocade, and we are also very much willing to play game with the community and help the community to really get to a stage where OpenStack uh, is really, you know, uh, I would say, uh, uh, really has this broad coverage in terms of technology on the storage side, side but on the IP side as well. OK. Oh, come on. It's a packed room with standing room only. There's got to be some questions, guys. Really, we're, we're going to turn this into like the interpretive dance session here, if, if you're not careful. Um, as I turn my own microphone off. Um, so I did have a couple other canned questions. Um, the one I, I was most interested in is customer use cases, um, how things, how you're handling hybrid or bursty workloads, or what story you have to tell in that area. If you don't have one now, what is your direction looking forward? And then uh, let's start at the far end and come this way again. Okay. So the, we have, a, we have um, probably eight or 10 interesting use cases of different variation that we are working with customers on. So a lot of times what happens is as you, uh, as, a, as accounts have questions, Fundamentally, it kind of starts with what's EMC's strategy and approach to OpenStack. And so we help a lot through those kinds of use cases. A lot of the use cases are basically, um, can this investment that I've been making you know, in EMC infrastructure over the last 10 years, you know, can I use that as a part of my private cloud deployment? And the answer is yes. And so we spend a lot of time on that use case, which is basically maintaining kind of legacy interoperability with your install base. So we talk a lot about that. Um, and then kind of moving forward, we're doing a lot of work around uh, with distribution partners such as, um, uh, you know, such as Rackspace as well in terms of kind of moving forward, net new deployments of private clouds or hybrid cloud models. Can EMC part of our, be a part of our strategic strategy, you know, our strategy there? So customers come to us all the time saying, I'm interested in deploying private cloud, moving my applications, you know, hosting them in a cloud environment, whatever. Can you be a part of that? The answer is yes, of course. So a lot of the use cases really have to do with kind of maintaining your legacy investment and then being comfortable that you strategically can continue to think about OpenStack and EMC. And, not, and uh, so that's kind of really um, kind of block and attack on what we're working on right now. So uh, Hadoop is an application on top of OpenStack. I won't bore you with uh, the data world. Um, 
But, I mean, people are looking to use OpenStack because of really three different reasons within the Hadoop world. First of all, it's provisioning services very quickly. Uh, being able to spin a cluster up, spin a cluster down very quickly. Uh, you know, like for instance, our engineering team will work on a 70 node cluster during the week to do development. You know, five days a week, that thing split across uh, five different teams. And then on the weekend, we're running performance testing on that thing. That's the, the most easiest way I could think about provisioning and reusing infrastructure for the various different purposes. Um, but there's a lot of reasons why organizations would want to spin up a cluster or spin a cluster down to do some sort of data science in, in some short term, right? It really ha comes down to the temporal nature, temporal, man, I can't talk today. The temporal nature of some jobs that are being run in Hadoop and um, being able to easily we're, provision we're, a cluster. It's the first day of the conference and you're already having like... No, I was up at 4 a.m. <laughs> so to catch a flight. Um, that, that's the first reason why people are turning to OpenStack to run Hadoop. Really, it's the provisioning side. The second side is, uh, well, it's the elastic nature, right? So being able to add compute and storage to a Hadoop cluster, well, Hadoop is compute and storage, right? So it's really kind of part and parcel to where organizations are going. So as they expand and as they get more data and as they ingest more data or they you know, uh, scale rapidly, they want to be able to scale rapidly without actually having to redeploy a cluster or make massive modifications to um, the Hadoop cluster, right? So the Hadoop cluster typically has X amount of nodes. We don't really want to care about the bare metal underneath, right? They want to separate those two sides, right? It eases deployment. And then the third part really is uh, the whole multi-tenant nature of which, you know, Hadoop has its own issues, right? If we think about security within Hadoop, um, right now within the Hadoop infrastructure, it's kind of difficult to actually, you know, s segment data off within a particular cluster. Well, if you're able to virtualize, you're able to spin up a cluster, separate it out in a virtualized environment, set up your firewalls around that, you're going to be much better off from a security point of view. It allows us to perform chargebacks. It allows us to uh, provision out clusters to parts of the organization, have them pay, right? So that's, those are the key kind of things that are going on in the Hadoop world. Hadoop is also very new to organizations. They're struggling to get their hands around it. Um, and if you think about it from a deployment point of view, it, it's, it's already a challenge because, well, we're starting off with something that's complex and new to the organization. You're trying to figure out here, how does it fit into your data center? We just really want to make that much more easier. And you start to see why the two of them kind of go along together because of, well, quite honestly, the workloads that are kind of being popped up around the organization. So I hope that helps. So, so the use case is one I've been sitting thinking about uh, for the last, uh, as these two other gentlemen uh, spoke to eloquently, uh, it's a little difficult to describe because we see interest and in adoption deployment across um, nearly every vertical and nearly every geography in very different use cases. I mean, perhaps it's an oversimplification to state that if you have infrastructure and you want to move it into an as a service model, OpenStack uh, facilitates that. And so, Granted, there is a, a, a lot of, I guess you could probably say there's been um, some predominant trends, certainly analytics, uh, clouds, uh, you know, big data. Um, you know, I mentioned uh, the, the desire to facilitate a, um, uh, apologies for the term, AWS-style AWS development workflow, but do it on-prem for reasons of IP or economics or there's several other reasons. Actually, national sovereignty, for, for example, in, in Europe. Um, so, so, apologies for the cop out, but it seems to be everywhere. Um, however, on the on the the notion of hybrid, yeah, apologies. So, so hi, on the notion of hybrid, um, I, I actually, we're doing quite a lot of work um, around the concept in general, and it's certainly applicable to to OpenStack. So, you know, within our our, our suite of capabilities, our product portfolio, we have something called Snap Mirror, which is a, a thin replication technology, and it's particularly interesting when you think about like hybrid use cases, you know, you, you think about, um, I guess, cloud as a utility. And, and usually it's kind of characterized as an electrical utility. You turn the, the switch and it's on. But data is different. Data has kind of properties of mass and gravity and, uh, you know, you have to get it from one place to the other and you have to fit it through pipes and latencies of consideration, things like that. So how do you do that in the most optimal way? And Snap Mirror, generally solves many of those problems by being a block level construct that, that is, you know, the, the data above it is somewhat opaque. 
Uh, it doesn't really care about the format of it. I can move it easily into an on-tap in a virtual, ma virtual machine resident in a cloud elsewhere. I could perhaps stand up um, a, a NetApp system in a uh, availability zone or hyperscale provider, perhaps via something like a Rack Connect, um, and then snap mirror into it, and then make something like in the case of Rack Spaces, cloud cloud servers uh, instances uh, uh, available uh, to that data set, or perhaps you would look at it in the inverse, the data sets available to the instances. Uh, there's hybrid is, an, as in my opinion, is still very much an unrealized promise of cloud. And, and part of that's because there's an, an ongoing effort to really standardize what it really means. Uh, we think that you know, one of the capabilities we have, we, we've got a lot of opportunity to kind of facilitate the hard work of it, which is the movement of the data and the accessibility of the data. Cool. So uh, a lot of our customers that are deploying OpenStack are, in the, are either large service providers or, or enterprise customers. And I guess I'll focus on the, the networking aspect of the use case, I think where a lot of them are coming to us and looking um, for us to, to kind of solve a problem for them is around how they can get the, the promise of, of OpenStack that it already delivers in terms of spinning up new VMs very quickly and connecting them together, but have that provisioning work all the way through you know, the end-to-end -end solution. So they can spin up a VM in seconds, but their network, they, their physical network, I should say, um, either has to be kind of statically configured or you need to open a work ticket with your networking team. And so by, by kind of being able to, they're really looking to integrate the, the provisioning both from the VM side, the virtual switch side, and the physical switch side so that when they go and spin up new workloads, it really happens end to end. I think on the flip side, you have the networking teams of, of, that are running these, these cloud deployments that have now lost some visibility into um, what's going on in their network. And they want to be able to correlate kind of the, the, the OpenStack you know, VM uh, the, the workloads that have been placed around their network, especially as you get to overlay technologies where the, um, all the traffic between VMs is being tunneled, they're kind of losing some visibility into how their network is performing. So how can we provide that visibility in an OpenStack environment back to the networking team to give them enhanced uh, debuggability and, and the ability to run their network as they did before in a non-cloud environment? Um, in terms of the, the hybrid uh, question, I think uh, you know, one of the things that, that certainly um, we've been working with certain, certain partners on and, and that we see as a, as a, a big part of this is um, encapsulation technologies like VXLAN, at least when we talk about it at the networking layer, where how can we take multiple um, data centers, uh, could be on-prem um, or, or off in the cloud or, or, or you know, just in different physical locations, and connect them together and orchestrate things such that um, you can have VMs that are part of the same virtual network that span multiple, multiple physical locations. Thanks. So, um, you know, talking about uh, you know, C-Micro's use cases um, and what we're seeing out there. So for us, a big part of it is how do you manage, you know, this, this converged infrastructure? And what we're finding, what, what a lot of our customers want is they want an easy way to deploy OpenStack. They want an easy way to manage, you know, a pile of servers, a pile of storage, a pile of networking. Because really what people want to do is they want to get to value. So you know, in a nutshell for us, um, what we find really compelling uh, to our, what our customers find compelling about what we're trying to do with OpenStack is the fact that it makes it easy for them to quickly deploy infrastructure as a service and their applications. Um, I'll talk about a couple of my favorite use cases that we can talk about publicly. One of them is um, a gaming vendor, uh, Red5 Studios. Uh, they're building a massively multiplayer online game. And they're actually using OpenStack to run their infrastructure. They're planning to run both in the cloud, and they also have a private deployment. And in this private deployment, they've used their system. And one of the, 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 the specific cases that we help them solve is if any of you go to gaming conferences, there's a, there's a bus that they're starting to drive to this conference to demonstrate the game. And on this bus, it opens up, and they have a bunch of gaming consoles, and they run a bunch of servers so they can run some games. But they needed to have the entire system, to have the storage, the servers, and the networking. And we really solved that problem for them because they were able to take one of our systems, put it in the bus, and entire, deploy the entire OpenStack and their entire software stack onto the solution. So it was one box plug it in, one cable coming out, and it provided their whole cloud solution for their hosted game. 
uh, you know, moving forward now as we see things evolve, how do we, how do we get to the hybrid cloud? So another use case we have is, um, you know, we just announced this, uh, we're doing this together with Rackspace and Rack, Rackspace's private cloud edition, is for the University of Texas, San Antonio. And this was for uh, one of their scientific computing groups, uh, research groups in uh, the university. And they wanted to build a biological you know, research computing stack. And the pro one of the issues a lot of customers in, we've talked to have had with OpenStack is the difficulty of deploying it. A lot of people have to invest a lot of their own engineers and a lot of their time to try to figure out how to get this stack deployed. So it takes a long time to get to value. And I think what we're starting to see with some more of these supported distributions out there you know, that are supported, certified on hardware, is now customers, instead of having to spend weeks learning, weeks deploying, can now try to get that deployed and installed in you know, hours, if not you know, a day. And uh, what this does is improves their you know, time to value. Because what you really want to do is you want to get to that utility model. And I think that's what you know, us, both as vendors, as those in the community who are trying to you know, enhance OpenStack, make it more enterprise ready, and also support it, can really bring and help grow this into, you know, grow it to the point where it's more adopted by customers. And we can really bring some value and accelerate uh, the acceptance of OpenStack. Excellent, thanks. Thank you. So from a, a use case perspective, I believe that uh, in a nutshell, I've got the same read that my colleague here. Uh, when we engage a prospect or organization on OpenStack, what comes across is really uh, applications that are the, the, the application that are really target for OpenStack going under OpenStack management, I would say, or big data type uh, uh, solution, but also VDI. Uh, I also seen some uh, uh, interesting instances where OpenStack wasn't so much looked as a cloud operating system but very much as a way to fully automate the provisioning process, right? So you, you've got companies out there that are looking at, if you will, taking OpenStack and sliding OpenStack under their homegrown application tooling and scripts in such a way that the business intelligence that uh, is included, if you will, as part of those tools can be leveraged against OpenStack. And the value of OpenStack is about automation, but it's about also uh, providing this consistent set of API across compute, networking, and, and storage, and that has a tremendous value to uh, many organizations out there. All right. Uh, purely from uh, on the uh, on the uh, hybrid uh, discussion, uh, I think that you know uh, there's a you know there's a an expression, a sentence that is you know stuck in my head uh, that I heard uh, I think two years ago here at this uh, at the OpenStack Summit. And the term has been coined by, you know, I don't remember the name, but the guy said that, you know, you need to own the base and rent the spike. And I felt like it was a very good definition of what a hybrid cloud should be. Uh, study shows that it's actually more cost effective to actually run anything that is predictable in terms of traffic into your private cloud and really just offload the spike into public cloud. And as a matter of fact, when we talk to uh, our customer, we actually have that discussion where some of them are actually wi willing to move away from public services and actually bring back their instances to create a private cloud. And you know, some of them are definitely con uh, considering uh, OpenStack as a way to do this. So this industry is basically set on this holy grail uh, approach which is the ability to move VMs between public and private environment. And uh, we see VMware going that route, right? They've got, uh, they acquired recently Dynamic Hops, which is basically uh, an automation system that can move application workloads. Uh, we also believe that Rackspace is uh, ahead of the curve in, in that uh, discussion with their private cloud offering. And Brocade is definitely part of this offering as well. We have had our first round of certification back in, in January this year. Uh, obviously, the, the goal for risk space is to get to you know this uh, hybrid type solution. And I think that uh, this should come pretty soon now. OK, so we are about at the end. I think we've got one question here that'll wrap us up really quick. We've got about a minute, so like 10 seconds a piece, maybe. With that? Yeah. Ten, 10 seconds a piece will be a trick. Um, 
when I look at the, the members that are represented on the panel, uh, there's at least one of you for whom this integration in with an open source project is kind of a natural part of how you do business. For the rest of you, probably not so much. And so my question is, how is being involved with the foundation, how is um, using this as a way to generate value for customers, um, how is it both challenged and how is it changing the way that you look at how it is that you take you know, essentially a hardware or a, a piece of firm technology value and deliver that out to customers? Um, because I think that, that how, some of these, uh, how some of the hardware companies overcome that challenge will say a lot about how much value they can provide out into that arena. So okay. be before we do, do that, you ate up the entire minute we had left with the question. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, I don't know what the rules are. I'm running over. I don't know if they're going to like hook us like they do I at say, the Oscars. I do it. So um, if we want to rush through it, <laughs> go, go. So yeah, it's, a, it's certainly a challenging environment for you know a large hardware company like uh, you know, like EMC, but we're clearly smart enough to be very excited about the interaction of cloud computing and open source, and we've made great headway uh, at EMC to get them um, focused on this uh, this opportunity. Our goal is to protect the community. I imagine that's who you're referring to. Um, so, so you know, we, we've been doing open source development over a long period of time. We derive benefit from it in our own products. We've had maintainers of, of NFS, for example, and Linux on staff for years. This is just an outgrowth of it. Um, open source is not anathema to us, not, not remotely. Yeah, I, I would say while we're a hardware company, um, actually a lot of the value that we sell to, to customers is actually on our software. EOS is an open operating system built on top of Linux. We push back all of our support and changes to, to the community and, and keep um, up to date with, with the, what's going on in Fedora and the Linux kernel. This is just, like you said, an, another version of this and, and we're excited about being part of it. As we said, um, our focus is really, how do we take the standards with Nova, Swift, Cinder, uh, and quantum, and we want to integrate that into our management layer to make our hardware easy to use. We're actually not trying to change that. One area we do want to innovate, which is different for the community, is bare metal computing, and that's what we're working on. But, you know, voicing what uh, my other panelists said, we want to protect the community, and we want to push that into the community as an open standard. All right, so uh, thanks for the question. Uh, I'm going to be very candid here. Uh, here at Brocade, we have been a bit challenged in terms of uh, really embracing open source effort. Uh, I think that uh, this open stack initiative within the company helped a lot uh, for us to realize that there is actually goodness in terms of uh, contributing to open source community. And as a matter of fact, you know, the vision has completely changed. And we recently acquired a company called Viata that del delivers a virtual router solution that is basically completely open source based. Thank you. Thank you, panelists. Thank you. Thank you.